truly a privilege to be here. I haven't been here in 20 years. Uh, the last time I was here was the last debate George had with Tom Foley, who was a wonderful, wonderful man, both George and the speaker. And it was one of these great, great campaigns, probably my favorite campaign of all times. George, uh, I had uh, run a rather controversial race. Uh, I ran Christy Whitman's race when she beat Jim Florio in New Jersey in 1993. And the White House and James Carville and everybody else was on the side of Florio. And we were 25 points behind. I took over the campaign with five weeks to go and we won. So as my reward, the, uh, the Attorney General of the United States and the President of the United States put a grand jury together to try and indict me. Uh, <laughs> So I decided uh, that that might have been my last campaign. So I'm having decided I'm going to take a low profile, and I'm having lunch with George and Mary Beth, who are two of my favorite people. As you may know the history of Mary Beth was this beautiful young girl from South Carolina, and George was the AA to the late Senator Ted Stevens. Every guy in town was after Mary Beth, so the only way George could get her was to grab her, bring her to Spokane, where all those southern boys and northern boys and everything else couldn't find her. So to make a long story short, we used to always kind of have a Christmas lunch as they were on their way to South Carolina. For, and so George says to me, are you going to do any more races? I said, nope, I'm done, finished, should have quit 10 years ago when ran Reagan's campaign. He said, well, I want to run against Tom Foley. And uh, what, do you, what do you think of that race? I said, you haven't got a snowball's chance of hell of beating this bigger guy. <laughs> He'll beat you like a drum. <laughs> Make a long story short, he said, well, I won't run unless you run my campaign. I said, well, that makes your decision real easy. Keep up the law practice. <laughs> so about three weeks later, I'm at the, uh, one of these big dinners. And who do I run in? I'd agreed to do the race, and I run into the speaker, who was a lovely, lovely man. And he said to me, Ed, what are you going to do this year? I said, well, I'm going to run a race against you. <laughs> <laughs> and he's with the editorial editor of the Washington Post, who was one of his best friends. And uh, he said, uh, he said, oh, he says, I, I don't know this guy, Nethercut, but he's supposed to be a nice guy. Uh, he said, I said, he is a very nice guy. I said, I promise you we'll run a great campaign. He said, well, don't run too good a campaign. And that's the kind of campaign it was. It started, uh, many of you may have been involved in it. It started with 1,000 people here at the convention center for a $10 breakfast, a Wheaties champion breakfast, and it went on from there to a probably the most publicized race in the country. Uh, every 60 minutes, everybody else was out here. I mean, thousands and thousands of people. Every political consultant in the country was on the side of the, of the speaker, and, and uh, they all spun us about 12 to 1, and we won by 1,200 votes. Uh, now, unfortunately for me, I was doing about five other campaigns, and somewhere in the course of that campaign, George mentioned that uh, we were all for term limits, but we were thinking of 12 years of term limits, but sometime between I was in Colorado and, Colo and California doing other races, he said he had only run for six. He thought six was a long time. Well, when six was up, he obviously, <laughs> this community wanted him longer, and we had to recover from that. It's a, it's a lovely, lovely introduction. Uh, uh, I'm always a little intimidated when I, when I have distinguished people, both in the audience and a distinguished uh, forum like this. And the mere fact that uh, Seattle has Scott Rasmussen, who's one of my dear, dear friends, and also appears on Fox, one of the best pollsters in the country, I know that they don't have 1,100 people there. You know, a pollster gets to, gets to, do, a, gets to do a, gets to do a plus or minus five, which means 10, so they might have 900, maybe even 800, so. <laughs> but he's a great pollster. If his polls are right, uh, which I believe they are, and he's been out front of this, uh, Mitt Romney will be the President of the United States in three weeks. So. I've had the misfortune a number of times of following famous people, and uh, Mitch Daniels, I understand, was your speaker last year. Uh, Mitch was my deputy in the White House. Uh, I had an amazing ability to pick great talent. I had the late Lee Atwater as a 26-year-old kid started working for me. I had Mitch Daniels, who was my deputy, principal deputy. I had Haley Barber, who was my other principal deputy. I had Andy Card, who was my other deputy. If any of them ever would have if I had known any of them were going to do so well, I'd have treated them better, but I didn't. <laughs> and that goes for George W. Bush. George W. Bush came in my office one day when the president was the vice president at that point in time. 
and he puts his feet up on my desk, and I have the old Nixon hideaway office. I'm the White House political director. Puts his cowboy boots up on my desk, and he said, I can't get a job. I need help. He's about 40 years old. His drinking days, I guess. And I said, it's not, it's not good enough running around with my daddy's vice president on your business card. You can't make a living doing that. He said, no, I need, I need a job. So if I really thought he was going to be president someday, even governor of Texas, I'd have taken really good care of him. I threw, I threw his ass out of my office. I put him on some consultant thing at the campaign, and the rest is history. Uh, and a great thing for the country. As I said, I have followed many, many famous speakers. And the great misfortune, a couple times, I even had to follow the President of the United States. And why would any staffer ever want to follow the President of the United States is beyond me. But I got stuck with it. I think it was one of my battles I was having with Jim Baker. I was the Deputy Chief of Staff, and, and he made me follow the President. So what happens when you have a big audience like this, and the President and hundreds of cameras in the background, that when the President finishes speaker, speaking, obviously no one cares what you have to say especially the Secret Service, who come up and re remove the seal of the presidency that's on the podium, <laughs> and it's usually nailed down, so they're tearing that down and moving it up. All the cameras and the, ca and the lights in the back are being moved up, and then you, the lights go up and you see your mother and her four friends sitting there in the front row. <laughs> so I'm most, most appreciative that you're all, you're all still here. <laughs> oh, we haven't fed you yet, so no wonder you're still here. Um, I've often thought we have a very distinguished European tonight. I've often thought, you know, having spent 40 years of my life and, and been in 10 presidential campaigns and worked for four different presidents, you know, I, I said it must be really great in these, you know, Great Britain or European, what have you. You know, you end your career, you get to be Sir Edward or Lord Edward or what have you, know. Here you're a hack, you know, you just, uh, and every so often you get lucky, you get a nice group like this that you get to speak for. And usually I have to pay my honorarium to come here, but uh, uh, for, for, me, for me this is delightful. Let me tell you quickly where I see this political race. This is an extraordinary race, and as I said, I've been in 10 presidential campaigns. I've never seen one like this one. This one is dead even. Uh, they, a lot of people want to compare it to the Reagan 1980 race. It's not like that. Uh, uh, first of all, the president's more popular than Jimmy Carter was. Uh, you have to remember that about 48% of the country at that point in 1980 were Democrats. Reagan got one out of four Democrats after he won. There's no one out of four Democrats going to vote for Romney or anybody else. Uh, Democrats are basically in their camp. They're partisan. Uh, if you're a Democrat, you're going to vote for the president. If you're a Republican, uh, after a long, hard battle through primaries and what have you, and an extraordinary debate uh, last week, the week before, uh, Republicans are fully engaged and fully behind the president. And that leaves this third of the electorate that basically is the independent voter, many young, uh, many who obviously uh, uh, decide sort of who wins the elections uh, and right today the president uh, Mr. Romney is winning independent voters. A Gallup poll today came out in which we are dead even among women voters. If we're dead even among women voters 47-47 uh, we're gonna win this election. Uh, I understand this is not a partisan group this is an extraordinary group I'm not a partisan, I'm just a Fox analyst. <laughs> Fair and whatever we, we claim we are. With a network with all the pretty girls. And Robin, you could be one of our great, you have to be beautiful and bright to be on our network and a couple old men like me. And Scott that gets to kind of tell what goes on. But here's where this comes down. This is an election that obviously is not a 50 state election. Uh, I wish it was. I wish it, I wish it was like 1984, in which we were running national campaigns across the country. I think that's good for the party. I think it helps develop young Republicans. It helps develop other candidates. But we're now down to five or six states, and we will spend, we actually are looking at 10 million voters out of a country of 300 million voters. We are going to spend $2 billion, both sides. $2 billion. And let me tell you what that amounts to, Robin. I'm going to make you, your heart uh, uh, flutter just a little bit here when I talk about television. One out of four dollars of the Obama campaign is being spent in the state of Florida. One hundred million dollars in television time has been spent in Florida since the conventions. One hundred million dollars. Now what that means is that if you live in Florida, You've not seen a commercial here, unless you're on Fox watching baseball or something, or CNN once in a great while. But $100 million in those kinds of commercials means it's wall to wall. 
Now, if you live in Ohio, you've only had $93 million spent. Virginia, $96 million. North Carolina, $70 million. And a state like Iowa, which we thought we had sort of finished with back in the Iowa caucus, it seemed to stay around forever, $56 million has been spent in Iowa. Now, that's enough for TV station to get healthy real, real quick. The team, now you have to understand, up until this election, since 1972, public money, with the exception of President Obama four years ago, has always been used in presidential campaigns. Meaning you walk in, as I did in 1984 when I was running Reagan's campaign, I went to the Treasury after he was the nominee, and I got a check for $40 million, $400,000, which I was all excited about. I thought that's the most money I've ever seen in my life. I thought baby Cannon, who was my treasurer, was gonna let me hold it for 30 seconds. I got one picture. It was, instead of all these zeros on it, which I thought it would be, it was 40M, 400K. I thought, well, that's a little anticlimactic. It's kind of like my weekly check that I get from the, from the government. If we would have run this cycle, and if they both hadn't opted out, it would have been $90 million. $90 million is enough money to run a presidential campaign. Uh, it's not enough to run the primary, but it's enough to run the general election, but not when you're gonna go spend $90 million in Florida. And they have three more weeks to go, so I predict it'll be $125 million in any of those states that are targeted. We're now down to 10 million people in the country that are targeted. We're down, down to five states. And here's the format. States that the president won all the swing states last time. There were 10 of them. He won them all. Those are traditional Republican states, and we have to win back five. We, if you wake up on election night, or you basically are watching it early here, you, you guys are out here on the West Coast. I, I should remember that since it's 11 o'clock my time here. If you wake up, if you're watching the, 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 the returns, and Florida is gone, uh, the Obama team has declared the winner, shut your TV off, go home. We have to win Florida. We have to win North Carolina, we have to win Virginia, and we have to win Ohio. We win those four states. No Republican has ever won without Ohio and no Democrats ever won since 1960 without Ohio. So Ohio's the ultimate swing state, it's the battle state. It's about a two or three point differential today. Uh, Obama's favorite, but it's closed dramatically in the last week. And anytime you have an incumbent president uh, within two or three points, you're in great shape. Uh, and it's gonna be a knockdown, drag out battle. These other battleground states are all within a point or two. Uh, we're ahead in Virginia, we're ahead in, in Florida, uh, we're ahead in North Carolina. Uh, we're a couple points uh, off in, in, in Iowa. So there's plenty of opportunities for us to, uh, to, to, to win this thing, but we really need those, those four plus something else. If for some reason, uh, and, and I'll, I'll tell you the real ultimate nightmare, if, if for some reason we lost Ohio, we can still come back and win this election. But here's the, the formula. You have to win North Carolina, Iowa, Colorado, Nevada, Virginia, New Hampshire, and Florida. That gets you to 273. But here's where it really gets interesting. If on that combination, all of those states have been Republican states in the not too distant future, all of those states are good solid states. If we lose New Hampshire, we're at 269, 269. And what happens at 269, 269? House of Representatives. And I bet you don't know that it's not every member of Congress gets to vote. It's the new Congress gets to vote. Each state has one vote. So the state of abortion actually gets to play. You have one vote. If you have a majority uh, of Republicans or Democrats, whoever it is, cast that vote. So the probability is that Republicans will continue to control the House of Representatives, and the probability is that we could win it probably 26, 24, if the format works out the way it looks like it is today. We don't want to win that way. <laughs> We don't want to win that way. I want to win with a big margin. Mitt Romney's going to have a good debate tomorrow night at Hofstra University. Uh, once again, I'm not in my partisan mode. I'm just trying to give you the best analysis I can. It's not easy to beat an incumbent president. The president is a competitor. Uh, there's a lot of people who obviously uh, uh, are disappointed in him. There's a lot of people who basically don't want Republicans. So it's gonna go right down to the wire. It'll be a knockdown, drag out fight to, to the very end. Now saying all that, we've been in a knockdown, drag out battle for a couple years here. Uh, in 2008, record numbers of Democrats voted. In 2010, record numbers of voters voted, voted Republican. 2010, voted Democrat. And here's where we are as a country. 
You live in a state that obviously hasn't been Republican for a while, although you've got a very competitive governor's race here. And, 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 and if, if for some reason the good attorney general here wins, uh, he's got a great blueprint by this organization to, as Ronald Reagan had when the Heritage Foundation put together a blueprint for uh, mandate for change in 1980. And at the end of the day, uh, it becomes very important to work together and move the, move the game forward. We have to get civility into this uh, dialogue again. Uh, going back to the Nethercut and the Foley, uh, that's where we have to go again. And if we don't go there, we're never going to solve the problems facing this country. You can't continue to spend a trillion dollars plus a year. Uh, we, have to, we need more revenue. Uh, Democrats obviously want to raise taxes on the rich. Republicans want to increase jobs, increase the economy, fix the economy, and create revenue. But the same way we have to reform entitlements. And if we don't reform entitlements, uh, uh, many of you who have children and grandchildren in this room will basically be with such a financial burden. At this point in time, the federal government spends $3.4 trillion. They take in about $2.3 trillion. That's not a good business model, and it's not a good business model for the foreseeable future. What do we get for our expenditures? We get Medicaid, which is very important, Medicare, which is very important, Social Security, which is very important, and payment on the national debt. Every other single dollar of federal money is borrowed money. Borrow from the Chinese or borrow from somebody else. Now just think about that. Every single program. Romney got blasted for his Big Bird uh, uh, last week. Uh, well, the truth of the matter is, I mean, I love Big Bird and everybody else in this room does. We love PBS. We have to reset our priorities in this country. And every single thing, whether it's a battleship, whether it's a soldier's benefits, which are a great, great military that has given us this enormous effort over the last decade, we have a tremendous obligation as a nation to take care of these young men and women who are coming back from an extraordinary effort on our part. It's, and it's not going to be cheap. But at the end of the day, unless we develop a civility, unless we can talk to each other, unless we can sit down, and the likelihood is Mr. Romney, may be elected president, Democrats probably hold the Senate, probably 51-49, Republicans are going to hold the House. Worst case scenario from my perspective, maybe not from some of you, is the president gets reelected, which is certainly a possibility. We hold the House, Democrats hold the Senate, right where we are today. The only thing we are today is we have, we have the fiscal cliff, which is this gigantic uh, effort of, of, of this built-in sequester with its cuts and automatic tax increases and all the rest of it. So unless we can start having some dialogue in which we can sit down and basically come to some conclusion, we're not going to continue to be the great nation and we're not going to basically be able to lay out the, the future. Having had the privilege of working for four different presidents, uh, and especially fond of the one I worked the longest for, which was Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan had an ability to sit down with the other side and basically negotiate. It wasn't quite all lovey-dovey as the historians have tried to write about him and Tip O'Neill sitting there drinking beer. Uh, on the, on the South portfolio, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, they could sit down, they could negotiate, and we've got to get back to where we find common ground and we can move forward. I had the privilege last week of being in Canada for a special dinner uh, honoring former Prime Minister Mulroney. Mulroney was the great Irish uh, Canadian Prime Minister in the 80s and the early 90s, and probably Reagan's best friend in the, in the, in the game. And this was the 25th anniversary of the Canadian-American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, and after we passed that uh, uh, substantially later, we, we made it the North American Free Trade, and we put Mexico into the, into the mix. And this was the night that they it came down to the wire. And they had three hours uh, to get this thing passed, to take it to the Congress. And Maroney told the story, Jim Baker was the Treasury Secretary, was the negotiator for the U.S. and it was a very tough negotiation and they, and they had, had broken down and they couldn't get it done. I mean, here's Canada, our best ally, uh, obviously had always been supportive of us. And so Brian Maroney picked the phone up and he called Ronald Reagan at 11 o'clock and he said, Ron, he said, you've been my best friend, you're my closest ally. Why can you negotiate a peace agreement with the Soviet Union your worst enemy, and can't negotiate a trade agreement with your best friend. <laughs> Reagan walked in, said to Baker, what's the issue? And Baker said, oh, it's his final. He said, give me a piece of paper. And he wrote on the piece of paper, give them what they want. He said, Baker walked in, threw the piece of paper on the table, and he said to the Canadians who were negotiating, this is direct orders from my president, from your prime minister, 
if you go too far and what you put on that piece of paper, I'll come back and undo it. But the point was, and as Mulroney said, these were two men who had got to know each other, appreciated each other, appreciate the fact that they were neighbors and to negotiate. Uh, and it was very, very important, uh, the long-term relationship between the two countries. We have to basically be able to sit down and negotiate uh, in the coming, because it's not just about us. Uh, it's, it's my 17-year-old daughter and your kids and your grandkids. Uh, you can't let a trillion a year debt keep adding up, adding up, adding up. Uh, and so I think to a certain extent, uh, uh, one man can make a difference. Uh, I, I watched it when we came in with tough times with Ronald Reagan, and I always sort of like to end with a little Ronald Reagan story because I always find people, many of you in this room, who supported him and many of you in this room. This is a very important state uh, in the early days. Uh, when I built my, my coalition to put, uh, uh, I never expected to win 49 states, uh, and might have spent a little more money in Minnesota if I'd have realized that we could win that, but, uh, <laughs> and would have let Beckel, Beckel stole 3,000 votes from me. He voted 8,000 dead Indians along the Canadian border. Uh, <laughs> And he'll admit it, uh, <laughs> but not 25 years later. So Vin Weber called me the next day. He was a congressman from, and it was our chairman. I think I'd given him $10,000. And Reagan had made the gracious uh, decision not to compete against Mondale in his home state. So it's his home state, let it go. And about every third day, Mondale was going into California, driving Mrs. Reagan and all of our Hollywood friends absolutely nuts. Uh, and then it got compounded by the Washington Post, ran a 50 state survey and it had us dead even in California. So she called me up and she said, you've been too confident running this campaign. The president's gonna lose his home state. I said, Mrs. Reagan, it's my home state. I promise you we're not gonna lose California. She said, oh, you, well, promises aren't gonna work. We lose California. So I dispatched Lynn Knopfsager. I spent a million bucks out of 40 that I didn't have, put phone banks the whole bit. Three days later, the Washington Post corrects its story with a little asterisk on page 839. Oh, we made a mistake on our front page story. California's 11 points ahead, which is as it turned out. <laughs> I called Ben Bradley, who was the uh, executive editor of the Washington Post, and I said, Bradley, it's bad enough you're beating the crap out of me every day on the editorial pages and the front pages. I mean, you got this mistake here. He said, screw you, Rollins. Just count it as an in-kind contribution to Mondale. <laughs> <laughs> So if you don't think the media are biased, just understand they are. <laughs> Ronald Reagan was a very special man. Ronald Reagan had this deep core of convictions. He loved this country deeply. And there's two little stories I'll tell you and I'll close on. One is we were coming back, uh, we'd been out campaigning, and we're coming back in, the, in Marine One, the helicopter. We landed at Andrews Air Force Base. We're flying across the, the city and there's no better ride. E-ride in Disney World can't touch coming across the city in Marine One. And we're landing on the south lawn of the White House. And, uh, he had pictures on the bulkhead of the helicopter of his ranch, and he said, uh, get up, and he sort of tapped. He was tired, and you know, you gotta always remember Reagan was 74 years old when he was running for re-election. His entire presidency, he'd been 70, been nearly murdered for the assassination attempt. He'd, he'd had cancer, he was deaf in one ear. He was still a better president to sleep than Jimmy Carter was awake, but it, uh, <laughs> Jimmy Carter didn't shoot down Libyan jets asleep. <laughs> he kept our wheat growers and our, and our javelin throwers out of Moscow. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I said to him, I said, Mr. President, I said, you know, someday it'll all be worthwhile. History will be kind to you. And he just turned him in dead serious. And, you know, there's about six people on Marine One. And he said, Ed, I don't care about history. He said, I'm going to be dead and gone when they're going to write it. You know they're going to distort it anyways. He said, all I care about is, is, uh, is those great young people we saw out there on the campaign trail today. And he said, you look, he said, your father's a shipyard worker. He said, my father was a drunk shoe salesman who could barely work. Paul Laxalt, who was his great friend, the senator from Nevada, was on the helicopter, he was his chairman of his campaign. He said, Paul's father was a Basque immigrant sheep herder. And he said, look at where we got in this country. And that's what we have to do for this country in the future. And we gotta make sure that those kids out there have that same opportunity. And I think that's what we're all about today. Uh, another quick story was in um, Memorial Day, uh, 1984. We found the remains. Uh, we had unknown soldiers from Vietnam and from World War I and World War II. We did not have remains from, I guess we did not have remains from Vietnam because they'd all been identified. And we found remains. And we were having the Memorial Day service and we were burying uh, a, a, an airman. Uh, as I watch these great young airmen today with their flags. Uh, and so it was this extraordinary 
moving ceremony. It was kind of like the end. We had the parades, we had the dedication to the Vietnam Memorial. It was kind of the final ending of the very tragic war that we'd been through and torn this country apart. So to make a long story short, we're doing the Air Force Academy graduation that day. The president rotated around uh, and did one each year. The president does West Point Academies and uh, Naval Academy. And this was the Air Force Academy. And we went out and hot morning and we were going to go on to California with a beautiful, beautiful mountain setting in Boulder, Colorado. So the president turns to the superintendent, who's a general, and he said, uh, I'd like to give each of these young cadets their first salute. Uh, and the general said, you're the commander in chief, sir, you can do whatever you want. Uh, and, and as you may know, the history of the salute that Reagan was the first president to salute. When he got off the helicopter the first time and he turned and salute, uh, his military aide said to Mr. President, you know, you, you, that's, that's something that's military to military. You, civilians can't do that. And he said, son, I'm going to be here for at least four years. Wherever that regulation in the Pentagon, you better get over and get it fixed because I'm going to salute each, every soldier I see. <laughs> Which, Every soldier does that. I mean, every president does that since, but he was the first one. So he stood there in the hot sun and he gave each one of these young cadets, you know, and he had that great movie star ability to make that great salute. Uh, and there were a thousand kids in the class. It was 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. It was hot. And there were about 100 young women in the class. Several of them threw their arms around him, gave him big kisses. And it was just an extraordinary day. And, and the part of the story that's touching to me is I was riding in the limousine with him uh, as we're going back to. And we're late. I mean, we're like two hours late. And uh, everything in a White House, at least our White Houses, not Clinton's or Obama's, but we ran pretty orderly White Houses. And so uh, everything's kind of held up. So in the car, I said to him, I said, Mr. President, uh, I said, you don't know what you've done for each one of those young men and women. And I said, they will always remember this first salute. He said, Ed, I didn't do it for them. He said, I did it for me. He said, the toughest thing in running for re-election is I know somewhere in the course of my next four years, I'm going to have to put young men and women back into combat. And my hardest day, the day I almost didn't run for re-election, was the day you and I and others were out at Dover when the 244 Marines came back. And I just thought, no man should have to do this. No man should see our, the, the sacrifice that's made. He said, so I wanted to be able to look in each one of their eyes and know that they're young men and women. They're not statistics. And I'll always think of that. And that doesn't mean I won't send them back in combat, but they won't be statistics. They'll be human beings. Now, over the last 25 years, the leadership of the wars we've been in, the first Gulf War, Kuwait, Iraq, Afghanistan, those bomber pilots, those lead people, have been that same officer corps. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's what a president does. A president leads his country. He loves his country. And we were very blessed to have Ronald Reagan. And uh, obviously, we have an opportunity in a few weeks. Uh, and I'm not in any way, shape, or form uh, uh, trashing President Obama or anybody else. Anybody who has that job, it's a tough job. But I think America has an opportunity to make a change. And America has an opportunity to go forward. And if we don't go forward, uh, you know, forward may be the slogan on, uh, on Obama's, uh, uh, I don't quite understand it. That's a direction, not a policy. But uh, needless to say, forward is there. Uh, but as a nation, we do have to go forward. As a nation, we have to basically have civility again. And we basically have to be able to talk to each other and communicate with each other. And organizations like this that set good public policy down on paper and think it through and try and find bipartisan solutions is the answer. Nothing is insurmountable for Americans. We have basically led the world. I chuckle as I watch the European common market get the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, no mention of us, uh, uh, you know, we basically kept the Soviets at bay for a long time, chased the Germans out of there, repaired their country, but needless to say, no mention of us. Uh, <laughs> I guess we got it with President Obama after 13 days in office and Al Gore. <laughs> no partisanship there, but uh, uh, at, 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 who wants a Nobel Peace Prize anyways? <laughs> but thank you for a lovely evening and uh, take care. Enjoy, enjoy the dinner.